Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this uh, final webinar, um, which we're uh, starting today. Thank you for this uh, great opportunity to meet with everybody um, and uh, just step into the future of healthcare and an evolution of healthcare in crisis. Uh, we are going to have a slightly different format today. We're going to actually work with um, four panel members um, and uh, also with Ian Chung, who's going to be leading and moderating this session. Uh, it's going to be an hour long, so we're going to have a little bit more time. We will be taking questions and, uh, um, and comments into uh, the chat there, but we won't actually have enough time probably to answer all of those questions or possibly even to pick some of them out. But we value your feedback. Uh, through there as well. We're also at the very end of this going to be uh, sending, asking you to feed back on the format and what you've heard. So please do spend a couple of minutes doing that and just giving us some feedback um, to that as well. And we'll also make these available, of course, on YouTube channel afterwards. So we have been traveling around the world. We've done a huge number of uh, miles as we've gone across the globe over this last four weeks. We've met experts in different areas of healthcare and we've had a fantastic conversation. I personally am so much wiser for the amount of time I spend talking to these fabulous people. And I know we're gonna gain it again today from that. But I'd like to say thank you. I'd like to thank Dr. Inti Chung uh, from Hong Kong, where we were listening really about that sustainable model of healthcare, at least 30 years of experience in data capture um, and all the information gathered from there. Benjamin Chi, unlocking the power of innovation within healthcare, but looking at telehealth and how we can move forward. And then we moved over the other side of the world to uh, uh, Brazil, Professor Gui, Gui Rebello, where the digital transformation innovation as a result of COVID-19 has impacted us. We've looked at radiology with Dr. Barak Agwal. And then we went into Korea and we looked at big data and analytics again with Dr. Huang. And before traveling over to New Zealand, where we've seen success, obviously in managing the crisis again, similar to, um, uh, to Korea, where they've really controlled the spread of the virus, and talking to Karen Black and Kate Resenberg around nursing and how we've transformed nursing through technology and education. Traveling over to Europe and actually talking to Pavi Salo and how uh, private healthcare is managing in, in this crisis and using telehealth to really move forward. Finally, working through to patient safety and quality, so important. And what we've noticed in this is how some of these key trends really have been addressed multiple times, accelerating new care delivery models. Telehealth has come up regularly, making data actionable, empowering patients and medical staff and training them as well. Patient safety, of course, has always been through their patient privacy, patient safety, quality of care and the underlying needs in healthcare. But overall, we've seen this better collaboration and communication across the different borders that we've been working. And that was really highlighted when we were talking with the Joint Commission and with Cathy about how collaboration can make a big difference in the, our care outcomes. And so we moved to today and I'm going to hand over to my colleague Ian Chung. Um, Ian is our Chief Medical Officer uh, here at Elsevier. A uh, fabulous colleague to work with. He's got a medical degree from the University of uh, Toronto. His experience really covers the whole continuum of care. And we use his, his brain and his knowledge really to understand not only how um, hospitals work, how doctors interact with their patients, but also a lot around medical terminology, knowledge representation, how that happens within healthcare as well. And uh, importantly, he's also a senior fellow at the Institute of Healthcare Design Thinking, which is really important on how we look at the future of healthcare. So I'm gonna hand over to Ian now, let him moderate four people. This is obviously gonna be a challenge in ensuring we uh, keep to time. And I leave that challenge with Ian. Thank you very much, Ian. Thank you, Tim. Thank you everyone uh, for joining us today, I appreciate it. It is indeed my privilege to introduce our esteemed panelists today. Um, and I'll do my best, and uh, next slide. Uh, 
in alphabetical order, we'll start with Professor Jane Griffith, who is the uh, Chief Nursing Information Officer currently for the Dubai Health Authority. Uh, she is a registered nurse from Australia uh, with extensive experience in various operational roles as Director of Nursing and, and, and General Manager role. Uh, she is currently based in the UAE uh, and her focus is on the, uh, as a S Chief Nursing Information Officer on the Salama EMR project and standardization of clinical workflows across all the uh, DHA facilities. Uh, and as well, she assumes many other leadership roles throughout UAE and is very well uh, published and, and uh, uh, an esteemed expert in this field and uh, is well known to many of us in the uh, healthcare informatics industry. Uh, Dr. Shaohua Kwa Gao is um, a clinical specialist and senior neurosurgeon uh, in specialized in minimally invasive neurosurgery with certification in spine, general, and trauma surgery. Uh, he has more than 10 years experience engagement in patient safety, both in Taiwan and abroad. Uh, his experience and background has given him a wide understanding on issues uh, faced by patients, uh, medical professionals, and the healthcare system. And he applies his leadership as a uh, as a Joint Commission International Surveyor as well. So again, really appreciate his background and uh, expertise. Uh, next, Dr. Sam Shah uh, is the uh, Global and Clinical and Digital Advisor uh, for Healthcare UK at the Department of International Trade and is an NHS consultant. Um, he has been very uh, active and busy and worked on various initiatives, including the flagship project to digitalize urgent care in the NHS, as well as efforts in areas of primary care, uh, public health, acute services, uh, education and regulation. Uh, and I believe he's remaining very active and uh, both within UK and internationally as well. I'd love to hear his perspective and, and uh, inputs. Lastly, Professor James Yip uh, is a clinical specialist in cardiology. Uh, he has led many innovative uh, efforts in information communication technology. Uh, he is a leader in Singapore with regards to uh, value-driven outcomes. Uh, Professor Yip is currently serving as the Group Chief Medical Information Officer of NUHS in Singapore and the Chief Data Advisor uh, for the Ministry of Health and uh, also a, a fellow uh, colleague with uh, some uh, uh, roots in, uh, in the Toronto healthcare medical system. So. Appreciate all of you joining us, thank you. So the three topics we thought we would raise to discuss, we think are very germane uh, to, to, to our times today. And I uh, hope you will also find that uh, equally interesting, stimulating, and uh, similar to, to what Tim mentioned, uh, I always walk away with new perspective, new insights, because we truly are talking and discussing these from a global perspective. And, uh, and, and that's very valuable to take the learnings and insights uh, that we are collectively picking up and learning in real time very quickly. So I think the acceleration word is something that's very germane to, to, to everything here. So we will spend some time talking about telehealth, uh, how it's accelerating uh, as a new model of care delivery. Uh, data is key to a digital uh, healthcare system. And we'll talk about things that are uh, relevant to, to, to consider and address there. And lastly, the people factor. You know, it's still about patient care and ensuring the outcomes that we expect to achieve. Um, and it's also the uh, dedication and, and, uh, and skills of our clinical uh, staff and clinicians. But with that, let's uh, dive in. So what we know from previous, what we've known and heard from previous uh, episodes is that without a doubt, you know, you know globally, uh, telehealth is rapidly accelerating. The concept was a new to us before COVID-19 uh, pandemic, but as a result of it, clearly, you know, the data shows the uh, number of outpatients being delivered uh, has stepped up tremendously. And we have some statistics from Australia. Um, we know there's challenges to consider, such as uh, regulations and, and uh, certification of qualified clinicians and things like that, as voiced by our representative from uh, South Korea. And almost universally, um, every healthcare system is tapping into and accelerating the adoption of, of, of telehealth. 
what I'd like to sort of comment on is, you know, I think telehealth has been something that's taken in various forms across the healthcare ecosystem around the world, as we've seen. Um, and we're going to have tremendous learning, right? There's going to be positive and, and, and challenges and barriers and obstacles, and each healthcare system is going to work through that. One of the comments I would like to make is, you know, as much as we talk about telehealth, i.e. the technology, I would just challenge ourselves to also step up and be thinking about um, the goals of telehealth as a technology, which is around enabling virtual care. Um, and I think uh, if I can uh, ask Dr. Shaw to start off, I've heard him also allude to this and pose this question, you know, why e-health and, uh, um, and not telehealth is really the future of remote care. And I think that's a very important distinction. Um, we throw technology at, at, at our challenges, uh, but let's also remember what we're trying to solve. Um, with that, I would ask Dr. Shah to lead us in that uh, topic. Dr. Chang, thank you so much for uh, inviting me today. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion, especially with my fellow panelists who are so experienced uh, in this area. And so for me, telehealth is itself almost uh, becoming a little bit dated and not because necessarily it's been around for that long, but because already on the horizon, there's the advent of e-health and the real, really the development of an ecosystem. And I find that both in the UK, but also globally. Some countries, some jurisdictions are further ahead than others. And if COVID has shown us anything, we've, managed, we've done really well to accelerate those things that are already within our gift, those things that are already within our reach. And the acceleration I've seen isn't necessarily transformational, but it's mainly been transference, one mode for another mode phone consultations for video consultations, physical consultations for face-to-face uh, -face, uh, consultations have all been switched into video forms, remote consultations. And those things have changed. If I take the UK health economy, we've certainly seen video consultations in primary care, the availability of the function move from what was almost 0% to 97%. There's been rapid expansion of the availability of the function, but uptake has been slow uptake has been closer to between five and 11%, and that's just in primary care. In secondary care, it's been much less so in the UK, and only now is it beginning to increase. And we have to ask ourselves why, what is it about legacy systems that might be resulting uh, in such slow uptake? Could it be something about the culture? And could it be something about the infrastructure that exists? Or is it something more, more sort of deeper within our system around our, the way in which populations interact that could be resulting in the slow uptake. And, and often we find point solutions emerge. So for telehealth, and if we look at the UK, we've got a national set of approaches, we've got lots of local providers, but they're not all necessarily integrated into the rest of the system. And from a citizen point of view, a user's point of view, it's not necessarily the easiest thing to use. If we look at the demography of the people using telehealth services right now, and especially right now during the COVID period, we know that people who are older are less likely to use these services, even in the UK. We also know that it depends on the local infrastructure, how much digital penetration exists, how much internet utilization exists. And I'm always fascinated by this. The UAE, uh, and Professor Griffiths on the court here, is the most digitally connected place in the world. It is the most digitally penetrated place in the world, more so than the UK or the US. The UK is only down at 94%, and places like Australia are lower down. These obviously have a play on how much the population uses telehealth. And then if we look at what's happened, it's been great that we've had some excellent developments and uh, the introduction of telehealth platforms, whether that's the likes of Babylon in the UK or Livy across Sweden and the UK or other platforms that are similar. But likewise, they end up sometimes becoming point solutions. We have to work much better at making them useful. And some of the things that we tend to find is that we, the underlying population isn't uniform. It's not homogenous, it's heterogeneous. And for that reason, we've got to do much better at trying to meet the needs of those individuals. So for me, we need to move into a place where we don't just necessarily meet one dimension needs, but multiple dimensions. And that's where I move back, that we move towards an e-health ecosystem using a combination of technologies, a combination of remote monitoring devices, of other types of technology, including the voice channel, that might be more useful in the future. So it's excellent that we've had acceleration during the COVID period, 
but I don't think it's sustainable. And I think to be sustainable, we need better infrastructure, better digital penetration, and a greater use of the ecosystem of products, of applications, of devices that are connected up, combined with clinical pathway design that's designed around a digital workflow, not just a physical workflow that's being transferred. Thank you. Can I ask Dr. Uh, Professor Griffith to ask, add to that and, and comment further? You're on mute. Thank you. Great for digital transformation, really. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think that what you're saying is absolutely right. I mean, it's um, it's a delight to be in the UAE because of some of those um, those um, additional benefits that um, that exist. And and certainly from our point of view, when we started the whole um, telehealth program last year, we were seeing you know sort of one to two hundred patients per month. Um, and during the COVID period, it's gone from that to seven thousand per month. Um, and that's with like GP type visits. We're now doing the pilots around our specialist visits. And that's actually been fascinating for me because I presumed exactly um, as my colleague has just said, that we would have an issue around sort of the elderly. Um, the advantage here is the fact that um, everybody has got at least three or four mobile phones um, and everybody is absolutely um, connected in social media and things like that. You know, sort of it, it is an extraordinary situation. Um, and what we're trying to do is to leverage off that because it means that we can start to have a look at, um, and certainly within the Dubai Health Authority, which is the government um, health care provision um, here in, um, in the UAE, um, then it's given us an opportunity to work <clears throat> with the licensing and regulation authorities as well um, to use our electronic medical record to actually facilitate um, this process. So when we have a physician that... Um, is doing a video conference with a patient, they're actually, it's almost as if they're doing it face to face um, with the documentation occurring in the electronic medical record. It allows them to um, order drugs, um, it orders uh, lab tests if it needs to. Um, the medications um, then get um, uh, sent to the pharmacy where um, they're verified and they're actually dispatched from there to the person's home. Um, so, the support that's required around that is pretty extensive. Um, but when you do it, it's extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. You know, sort of the feedback that we get from elderly patients is, I don't have to try and get here. Um, and they may have to come with a relative. Um, so it means that the relative comes, everybody gets confused, they have to try and park. Um, Mum or dad might be a bit confused mentally anyway, um, or they might be frail. So um, they're staggering around trying to actually get into an appointment that they're then sitting in a waiting room for an extensive length of time. Um, and then they have to travel back to wherever it is that they live. Um, and so when we first started to do it, um, we actually got them to come in for a normal appointment, but put them in another room, put the physician in another room and got them to play with the technology first. So that when they actually got it to work, um, then the older patients were unbelievably excited to say, we don't have to come back anymore. Um, and, um, and we had exactly the same situation um, with our paediatric patients where mum was dragging five kids in, um, which is no mean feat, um, to try and keep them under control and keep them in control in the car. Um, and, um, and we were doing it the, one of the first consultations um, with an eight-year-old child um, with the physician attempting to actually use the technology and, um, and the child got up, went into the room where the physician was and actually taught the physician how to do it. Um, and like mum was unbelievably excited again um, by the fact that they weren't necessarily having, going to have to present for every single visit. So, you know, so the outcomes are absolutely phenomenal for us. Um, and again, as my colleague said, um, starting to use home monitoring devices, it means that we can actually keep people at home um, for much longer and yet pick up um, through um, artificial intelligence and stuff like that when their home monitoring devices start to actually demonstrate that, um, that their condition is deteriorating. Um, so the potential for us, I think, is absolutely extraordinary. What we need to do post-COVID is to make sure that we can, get, um, can keep the momentum going. Um, 
because it really does have enormous potential for all of us. Thank you. Some great points there and love the, 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 the illustrations of how important it is uh, to address the patient consumer from where they are, right? We're all heterogeneous. We all have our different cultures and familiar with technology. So some really good practical examples. Uh, can I ask uh, Dr. Gao to step in and share his experience and observations from uh, the Taiwan healthcare system? Yes. Uh, I think before COVID-19, I think the progress of telehealth, either in IT technique or business model, is far beyond our imagination. Uh, technology development, business model, innovation, and the capital investment focus on how to build an accessible and affordable telehealth care ecosystem. But as the IT cost and the barrier for telehealth users are getting lower and lower as the development history of e-commerce, the challenge of future telehealth, I think, should be how to deliver quality signal from provider side to user side before the purchase or, or the transaction happen, and how to convert the behavior of telehealth from single purchase to repeat interaction so that the whole ecosystem could be sustainable, that's my opinion. Another issue is the value for, uh, of frontline healthcare providers. I think the pandemic of COVID-19 actually remind us a key element of telehealth, which, uh, which was seldom emphasized before, the last mile of telehealth. I mean, in addition to remote interaction, uh, like uh, diagnosis, healthcare education, or even prescription, who and how to provide the final tangible care and services may have the chance to innovate the real value of a certain kind of telehealth model. For example, before COVID-19, we, we usually consider telehealth of long-term care, for example, as how to monitor the condition of the elderly. But COVID-19 reminds us the most valuable part of long-term care may be who and how to make beds and change sheets for the elderly correctly. That's why I learned and changed my mindset for telehealth after COVID-19. Very good point. Thank you. Uh, and Dr. Yip, your thoughts? Uh, we've seen an explosion of telehealth in Singapore. Before COVID-19, I, I would say maybe about 1% of all our repeat visits uh, would be on some kind of uh, telehealth platform. Uh, but with COVID and with our lockdown, uh, it's risen to... 6% and uh, there are moves, at least even in my institution, to move it to 30% of all our outpatient repeat visits. Uh, in fact, it's been set as a goal in, in my cluster that uh, uh, this is something that we aim for. Uh, we've also seen a redistribution of the type of uh, workforce that we used to have. Uh, you know, we used to have people who are cabbies that you could hire on a mobile device. Uh, now they are delivering medications to our patients after telehealth visits. So, so a transformation, uh, they also do home food delivery as well, so you can get two for the price of one. <laughs> so so we, are, we, we are seeing a transformation the way we do our business. And, and for the elderly, um, uh, it's been phenomenal because everyone now suddenly knows how to use uh, one of these platforms like Zoom or WebEx, uh, you know, we didn't have to teach them because suddenly that's the only means of communicating with big groups of people. And instead of uh, wasting that time trying to uh, educate people, uh, uh, everyone has suddenly been educated overnight uh, due, due to uh, the only means possible. So we, we've seen this uh, new change in behavior. Uh, we've also had a chance to introduce uh, uh, new technology like chatbots, you know, so uh, everyone knows how to use uh, WhatsApp uh, or uh, Twitter, not so many, or Telegram for that matter. And we found this to be a very engaging platform, especially when you put an AI chatbot behind WhatsApp or Telegram. Uh, and, and this has been engaging for people to, to the point that we, we have been able to use these chatbots uh, to uh, 
to, to drive behavior uh, to seek certain people and we can connect them up via these chatbots when they look for services. Uh, on the reimbursement side, uh, we used to have only seven conditions that we could get reimbursements from from doing telehealth and suddenly anything is possible. Every type of conceivable outpatient visit uh, is uh, available for some form of reimbursements and for certain conditions, uh, you can even use your health insurance to pay for the entire uh, visit uh, on telehealth. So it's been an explosion of uh, new services uh, redistribution of workforce and, uh, and enabled by this telehealth explosion, in, at least in Singapore. Very good. I, th I heard the term sustainability come up multiple times. So I think clearly sustainability is not assumed. It takes work as collectively we've talked about. And if we really do want the increased uptake, which is really about increased adoption by both clinicians as well as the consumer patients, it's, it, it's looking at it from a systems perspective and making sure we get engagement and positive results that we would expect. Otherwise, it's, uh, it's no point. So thank you very much for that. That was very uh, a good conversation on that topic. Um, let's move forward to the next one. Uh, related to it, but, you know, the, the value of data, right? So, um, so much of what we're doing is really about um, providing care virtually. That means we need information, we need data about what's going on uh, with our patients and the progress of their care. Um, again, some validation from earlier episodes where um, you know, the data, again, is not assumed. We, we think it's a given, but if we really want good data that we can use and, and, and make it actionable and support virtual care, um, it takes effort. And that's a challenge that uh, many uh, previous uh, attendees have, have articulated as a concern. Accuracy of data and data integrity. Um, you know, the veracity of the data as well as the validity. Um, and then another comment was around the standardization of data. Um, you know, when we as clinicians hear words, we process that based on our learning and understanding. Obviously, we need data codified or more, be machine readable, interpretable if we want to leverage the data for decision support. AI, predictive modeling, and things like that. So um, a lot of background work that needs to take place. Uh, on that note, um, you know, as we think about data now, uh, we quickly just go to immediately the medical data that we are all very used to. But as COVID-19 is also identifying, the relevant clinical data is quite encompassing, right? We have uh, examples of the value of travel history and immigration data, um, employment, social economic and social demographic data, um, contact information and relationships, social network. Um, so at some point you're thinking, well, everything has a healthcare context. Um, so, you know, the question I would like to pose is, you know, how do we see as a priority for this new reality around data? Um, is it more data is better? You know, the, the proverbial big data? Or is it really around um, small little data that's very uh, focused, but very clean, very um, high integrity? Um, questions to, to leave for this group. And can I ask Dr. Yip to lead us off, uh, uh, given his background and work with uh, data in Singapore? Uh, I, I started off my career doing clinical decision support systems. Uh, and I, I moved beyond that because as you've seen the HIMSS analytics, uh, uh, framework, uh, uh, you have to move from level uh, one to level nine now. And one of the things that I've been deeply involved with is the concept of value, you know. Uh, value is one of those new concepts that, uh, that uh, both clinicians who look at clinical quality and safety uh, can agree on with administrators of the hospital system who wants to basically reduce waste, imp improve profits, uh, uh, and, and if you put the two together, then basically this is quality over the cost it took to deliver that care and the service that you provide. Uh, data is what uh, gives you this ability to quantify a value. Uh, and, and one of the things that we, we started doing in Singapore, and at least in my health system, we, we have about close to 43 conditions, and these are specific conditions like hip replacement, uh, heart attacks, uh, colon surgery, uh, where we define with clinicians, and it's, it's 
is crazy to, to think that, you know, uh, clinicians don't really know what is the meaning of quality when it comes to a condition that they, they know so closely. So when you get them to sit down in a room and define what is quality, uh, it comes out with different answers. So, so the need to standardize what that quality means uh, and then look at the cost it took to deliver that, you know, so each of these conditions were standardized across and we've now even pushed this forward to become a national platform uh, where we want to move from just looking at uh, improvement in quality of healthcare services to improvement in value of healthcare services. So uh, this is one of those things that is data driven, which is all healthcare systems we now have to examine carefully because after COVID, uh, we have lost a lot of money. You, you know, uh, I, I mean, although healthcare workers have been employed in, in my country, uh, uh, but we've been taking care of mainly COVID patients and we, we don't make any money from COVID patients. Uh, but we've lost money in terms of our elective procedures, in our outpatient volumes. Uh, so, so it is a time for healthcare to start re-examining themselves to see what, what indices do they want to look specifically for the conditions that matter. How can they reduce waste? How can they, uh, uh, how can they improve their quality uh, amidst this new uh, climate where you know, less and less cash is available? And then when you've started with that uh, framework and you move upwards the chain, then data will be in terms collected uh, for more personal analytics for the future. So I, I guess we can start small and define what we do best in terms of quality uh, and then move upwards the chain to see what it is that we need to do things like predictive analytics and artificial intelligence that are directly built for patient care. I'll, I'll give time for other people to say a few more words. No, appreciate it. Thank you. Great thoughts there. Uh, Dr. Gao, can I ask you to weigh in? Hello? Yes. I think uh, during the early stage of COVID-19, I think the information structure in most countries very easily to fall into chaos. Even the information and uh, communication among healthcare professionals. And this chaos comes not only from being unable to verify or validate the information during the crisis, but also from information overload in the crisis stage. For example, for the frontline caregivers, there are the most important professionals group who need the correct and the updated information. But during the crisis, each individual professional may, may have only few minutes per day to receive the key information after their exhausting job every day. So I think the first priority for making data actionable especially in the major crisis of COVID-19, in my opinion, is how to maintain a collaborative but trusted platform for professional information. And based on this platform, professional information could be collaboratively, collaboratively inspected or reviewed by interaction. Then together we can make the raw information trustworthy. Very good point. Um, you know, I think data is so important yet um, it's assumed it's, it's good. And again, it's, it takes effort to make this become something truly of value. And the other point I make is I think we start with the end in mind with data as opposed to always just going after data for data's sake. And those are some uh, good perspectives. Uh, can I ask Dr. Shah to weigh in? Well, I, I'm really encouraged actually by what I've uh, already heard. And I'm really glad that Professor Yip mentioned uh, sort of value there. Because ultimately, data and data in healthcare is about improving that value exchange. What can we do to reduce the friction for citizens, for clinicians? And how do we go about improving the, the value exchange? And, and that is, you know, a, a, that's a very important uh, dimension to why data is important. And the second thing is, it's about improving outcomes for individuals, not data for data's sake, but data that will help us improve outcomes and reduce inequalities. And if we've seen anything from COVID, that in healthcare, as we probably all know, 
we have a very small impact on outcomes and on inequalities. Actually, most of that takes place out there in wider society. So all the more reason for us to connect together data sets that are much broader than health data. And this then takes us on to the quality of that data, irrespective of what source it's from. Let's take any other industry, banking or retail or any other sector. They use multiple sources of data and that data to drive value and value that goes beyond their, their, their sort of index use case. And if we take retail, they understand their customers. But we don't necessarily do the same in healthcare. So we need to do much more to understand our citizens and our citizens in every aspect of their life if we're really serious about improving outcomes and reducing inequalities. I often get asked, do I think data is the new oil? Well, similar to oil, you have to refine it, right? So we've got to refine the data. But different to oil, data in healthcare and data is endless. It's not going to run out. It's going to keep on going. So I definitely think there's a massive role for using data in a better way to improve outcomes and reducing inequalities and using it to support transformation. But to do that, we must get much better at refining the quality of that data and making sure that data relates to a better outcome rather than data for data's sake. And that means moving away from traditional code sets, maybe moving away from not just using ICD or other things like that, but moving towards those things that might be coded similar to SNOMED, but there'll be other code sets as well that we don't even know about that will evolve. So uh, absolutely supportive of better data, but for the sake of improving value. Very, very good point. Uh, Professor Griffith. Your thoughts? I would, um, I would absolutely agree. I think one of the things that's come out of COVID that has absolutely um, attempted to give us the most enormous wake up call in the history of the modern earth um, is that it's all very well for everybody to suddenly wake up at two o'clock in the morning and decide that they want um, a particular set of data or a particular report or whatever it is. There's not a huge amount of discussion or understanding of what that means. Um, and the other part that, um, that's certainly been brought home for us is that it's absolutely critical that the actual front end data entry is actually clean. Um, you know, sort of if, if we get people who, and, and you know, sort of for us, we built an, ex, an extra 17 odd thousand beds. Um, to be able to staff those and to be able to register those patients in there, then people were pulled in from all over, um, like Dubai just about, um, some of which had absolutely no background at all in being able to register patients or, or use a system or anything like that. And so the data that came into the system um, was significantly lacking and, and people were doing whatever it was to do it as quickly as possible. Um, and again, giving an example like I did before, um, we ended up with, um, with 10 people when we were looking at the religions who were actually Amish. Now, for people to come from Pennsylvania in, um, in a buggy um, pulled by horses all the way to the UAE is something I want to see in a car park. Um, and yet, if you think about the Amish religion, it starts with an A and so therefore it's the first thing on the drop down list. Um, so I think that we need to recognise that as we move forward, I absolutely agree with my colleagues that we need to start to look at some of the social determinants of health to find out what is happening and what is it that our patients need. Um, and, you know, sort of do they need to have surgery so they can play a piano after the surgery when they couldn't do it beforehand? Um, so I think that we need to start to look very much at the fact that health provides data like nobody else does. And we have to be much more realistic and much more rational in the amount of data that we collect and how we use it and the quality of that data to actually focus in at the end of the day on caring for our patients or our clients or whatever we want to talk about. Because at the end of the day, that's what we're here for. We're not here to make it all look very gorgeous and to produce more reports than anybody else. So. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm tempted because this is a, such an interesting topic for me as, a, and as an informaticist. So it, it takes a her, Herculean effort just to think about data within our local healthcare system and how to optimize that, right? And to, to a point being made earlier, it's not just data for data's sake. It's really what are we trying to do with it? What are we trying to achieve with it? But then what COVID has also shown us and, and taught us is 
there's so much learning to go across our own local ecosystem. And then when you talk about data, so the question I pose is if anybody has a quick answer or, or, or a, a predictive vision of the future, it seems like we have to operationalize and, and optimize locally with data, yet connect and to your point, Dr. Shaw, standardize what's the new data set that we have yet to define, but we have to do it globally so we can be use the data at that scale. Can we do it? Is it achievable? Anybody weigh in? Well, I don't think it's probably ever going to happen. I, I think like uh, any, we'll get, we'll get closer to it, but I don't think we'll ever get there. But that's the nature, I think, of any system, right? We're in, we're, we all operate in complex adaptive systems that are constantly evolving. And in the very same way that new, new diseases and viruses are being uh, created every day naturally, I think our requirements for data will evolve themselves. So I think we'll get better at standardizing and having translatable data, but equally we'll never catch up. But in some ways that's not a bad thing because it will push us to keep on creating new, in the same way we create, have new drug discovery, we'll come up with more innovative and creative ways of combining and translating yes. data sets as well. And, and I see a space emerging where we get better at that translation, more so than necessarily just creating a standard. Yeah, very good point. I think you're the voice of pragmatism amongst us. Um, and I think what you describe is the human journey, right? We, we envision a better destination and we work hard towards it, realizing that to get there is hard work and we may uh, fall short, but we don't stop trying. So thank you for that. Um, let's continue on to the next topic and uh, hopefully this will be equally uh, stimulating. And I think this is germane. Um, it's all about the human factor. Um, and, and what we've seen through, through COVID is, um, you know, we were lacking in a good template for how to respond to COVID. Um, so our constituents, our key stakeholders have had to step in and step up. We've seen her, you know, grand efforts by clinicians trying to do their best meeting the demands of, of their healthcare needs in their various ecosystem. Um, and simultaneously, I think we've also seen consumers and patients having to uh, be more engaged to uh, figure out because the healthcare system that they knew started to pivot and focus on something else and they were left on their own uh, when their doctor's office had to close due to uh, quarantine or isolation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And this mirrors some of the comments and feedback from others in the sense that, um, you know, as patients had to step up and be more empowered for this COVID experience and their needs during this COVID time, um, does that create a window and experience for them to draw on moving forward? Um, and similarly, on the healthcare side, um, many systems are short of um, uh, the, the anticipated qualified clinicians that we will need, not just for the pandemic, but even going uh, onwards. And as clinicians had to quickly adapt, uh, transition from pediatrics to adult care, in some cases from uh, surgery to, to ICU, right? Um, the learning, the quick on the job skills development that was necessary, again, challenge clinicians to step in and step up. Uh, so is there a greater potential that uh, nurses, for example, uh, can apply themselves and expand their scope of, of skills and allow them to practice at a different level of, uh, of capabilities. And that came up in, in a previous uh, episode as well. So very interesting how both this is impacting our clinical understanding and process, but also the consumer's experience and the new reality may be something that allows us to move this, uh, move the bar forward. Thoughts and comments and can I ask um, uh, Professor Griffiths to lead us off here? Absolutely, something I'm unbelievably passionate about. The, there's a couple of things that have come out of COVID, I think that um, are actually a benefit to the, to, to the world, um, even though I probably shouldn't say that. Um, but one of them is the fact that we absolutely um, have to refocus um, the fact that our patients are the center of our universe. Um, and, and I think that this has been a very rude awakening or 
a very not so gentle reminder um, to everybody that, um, that works in healthcare um, that we're here for the patient, not necessarily for whatever your own individual um, desire might be or your need to do something or your career progression or whatever it is that you might have focused on um, in the past. Um, and I think that that is a wake up call that we absolutely needed. Um, and I think that what's happened to, to patients through this entire process, what's happened to our healthcare professionals through this entire process has been one that's absolutely terrifying um, because the nature of the disease, um, the rapidity of it, um, of the spread of the disease um, has taken, I think, everybody by surprise. And the changes in um, the actual clinical practice that's been required almost on a daily um, or weekly basis has also been terrifying. Um, I don't know that we've really ever faced a situation where um, one day we think that um, patients should be, <coughs> pardon me, on a certain drug, the next day they shouldn't be. One day we should ventilate them, the next day we shouldn't ventilate them. This is not what healthcare has been um, um, <coughs> pardon me, viewing historically. I mean, like historically we've used evidence-based practice and everybody's been very comfortable with that and people have gone off and they've done, you know, sort of random control trials and done all of the, the, the good research around it. And, um, and this has knocked everybody for six. Um, and I think that um, what's happened is, is, is that refocusing of one, the patient being the centre of our attention, and two, the extraordinary adaptability of our healthcare professionals. You mentioned before um, about, you know, sort of surgeons becoming intensivists. And certainly that's been the case here. Um, traditional um, physicians who are ophthalmologists or dermatologists or um, even some of our uh, obstetrics and gynaecology people or even our neurosurgical people um, have had all of their, their clinics cancelled and their elective surgery cancelled. And so suddenly you're actually out there in, um, in the COVID hospitals actually looking after um, patients that have got really significant respiratory disease or neurological diseases. Um, and, you know, sort of I, like I've been out there with them and, and like they've said, I've got no idea what I'm doing. Um, but they've like they've done it and um, and they've continued on and they've continued to seek um, advice and support from from their colleagues that do have expertise in this area. So I think that um, it, it's a wake up call that needs to continue. And I think that um, we need to recognise the importance of everybody in healthcare provision. Um, and the fact that it doesn't matter whether or not you're the cleaner or whether or not, you know, sort of the, you're the head of neurosurgery, um, your role in, in providing good health care is equally as important. Yes, yeah, very good point. Sam, uh, Dr. Shaw, can I ask you to chime in? Well, I mean, I, I think uh, Professor Griffith has summed it up absolutely fantastically. But, you know, really, ultimately, this is about people and about citizens. And one thing we can't forget is that we are all people and what can we do about reducing the burden on the way in which people operate? If we are going to end up in a system that has to be flexible, we need to be flexible for both sets of people, the clinicians working in the system and the citizens trying to act, interact with the system and access the system. And historically, if we take the space of any form of digital transformation, it's been notoriously difficult. We've ended up introducing burdens for both groups. We've ended up putting in things that take longer, that add burdens, that add difficulties, that add friction. And if we've seen anything about the stress that's being placed on both people using the system, as well as the clinicians working in it, we've got to do everything possible to reduce that friction, to reduce that pressure, to reduce that stress. So it's almost incumbent on all of us that if we are going to move towards an e-health ecosystem, we have to start off with the needs, the clinical need, the emotional need, and the practical need of both of those groups, and to design the service and the digital ecosystem around those three needs so that we reduce the friction, so we reduce the burden and make it easier. And it might be that we still are going to need clinicians to flux and switch between those different practice areas, between different roles, we might end up with new roles emerging in our workforce, but we have to make it as easy as possible for the system to interact and the clinician to do their job. And, and historically, we haven't been very good at that. So for me, it's about the three needs. 
whenever designing any digital ecosystem, and whether we think about data or whether it's telehealth, we move to e-health, those three needs are the things that we must have at the, the, the front and you know, beginning of any dialogue we have. Thank you very much. I wrote them down. I've got those three things and it would be part of my uh, concept. Uh, Dr. Yip, can I ask you to weigh in? Uh, COVID has been extraordinary in transforming healthcare. Uh, one of the things that I, I've been quite proud to be involved in is that we developed a, a symptom checker for the country. And, and basically, if you know what's been happening, it's like almost every week there's a new health directory uh, coming out to say with COVID and this, do this, with this symptom, do this. And, and the citizen just cannot navigate through this complex process of where to go if they thought they needed to get swapped, for instance, or see a doctor. Or, and, and, and one of the things that we did was that we empowered the citizens to say, hey, I've got this set of symptoms. Uh, I've no history of contact with COVID. Uh, I've lost my sense of smell. Uh, you know, where should I go? And, and with this checker, we, we, we told them, uh, go to these places, and this is where you can get uh, a swap for free, uh, and, and your doctor will tell you what to do next. And so to navigate a complex system, we had to empower uh, the citizens to go to the correct places rather than waste time in the wrong queue. Uh, another initiative that we, we did was that we had these large community health facilities where, where we had patients who were recovering from COVID and they couldn't go back home yet. Uh, and what we taught these people how to do when they arrived, we had these running videos to teach them. Uh, this is how you take your own pulse oximetry, blood pressure and temperature log it into a uh, phone app uh, and then let us know, you know, we provide you food, board, lodging, uh, and all you do, need to do is just do this for us. And, and you, you, you cannot believe that in a facility of uh, say 1,500, we mainly only had 20 nurses to be able to watch all of them because uh, most of the work in these recovering patients uh, were done for either patients and, and we would chat with them regularly off uh, one of these uh, apps when they had concerns, you know, uh, and, and then they will use some kind of tele uh, uh, consultation system in order to get care while they were recovering. So, so this kind of transformed the way we interacted with patients overnight, you know. Prior to this was a traditional system where people would, uh, uh, would have to, you know, go into a ward, you'd be monitored the usual way, uh, but this was a, a different model of care, uh, which we had to do because of the large numbers of people that we had to suddenly care for. And, and for the healthcare providers, uh, we had all these administrators who suddenly had nothing to do, uh, and, and they became healthcare workers, frontline healthcare workers overnight, and, and that has empowered their uh, them from uh, you know a finance officer now being uh, someone who did triaging at a fever tent uh, or some of them were even good enough to do swabs with us so so overnight we we we, we create a new workforce from our traditional workforce uh, we change everyone's skill sets uh, we upgraded everyone so if you were a private soldier in the army of healthcare uh, you would now be a lieutenant and, and everyone had a field promotion during uh, COVID. So it's been a remarkable experience for us. Well, that's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Dr. Kao, can I throw it to you? Yes. Uh, I agree with the, the opinions from my colleague I, and the other expert. I think medical staff in the countries ever experienced or are still experiencing COVID-19 will agree that the priority rationale for healthcare resources would possibly be the most suffering part during the pandemics. So the first step to empower medical staff during the crisis of COVID-19, in my opinion, is uh, to clarify the priority rationale for scarce resources, as, uh, so as negative pressure room, ventilators, or even PPE. Moreover, the priority rationale could be also applied to the principles within the healthcare organization. For example, what kind of rules should be insisted even during the crisis? For example, the, the patient identification or so. And the, what kind of SOP or regulation should be optional or even postponed 
or be reasonably adjusted. Just like the rule of engagement for military purpose, a clear and updated rationale in advance for each level in the healthcare organization will be the fundamental to empower medical staff. Then we have the chance to communicate with patients about the rationale and with the assistance of reliable information to improve the information asymmetry in the crisis and empower the patients for the decision making. That's my opinion. Thank you. Yeah, it sounds like, you know, we have the opportunity to actually use this chance to revisit what we do and really make medical care more truly human centered, a humane process uh, that benefits and improves the lives for both clinicians as well as the, the patients that we serve. So thank you very much for all these great thoughts and, and, uh, and motivational ideas um, and experiences. So let's go to a quick round robin around, you know, finishing thoughts and, and, and uh, uh, around something that we all have in our top of our mind, right? Will healthcare be the same again, ever? Um, let's just go around and quickly add our closing thoughts. Dr. Kao, can you start? Yes, I think, of course, not the healthcare will be no longer the same after COVID-19. Yeah, I, I wrap up three points about that. First of all, as our discussion, including telehealth, the way to use healthcare data, and the effort to eliminate information asymmetry, the way we look at the healthcare system has been profoundly changed because of COVID-19. And the second one is the change of global healthcare supply chain. Lots of countries suffer from critical resources shortage during the COVID-19, and this experience will result in global healthcare supply chain relocation or even the change in the whole healthcare manufacturing ecosystem. And the third one is about the preserved capacity, especially in the countries which, which private for-profit hospital as the major healthcare providers, cost effectiveness or uh, efficiency or the, uh, what the organization leaders or policy makers or managers usually concern. But after COVID-19, short of preserved capacity, either in human resources or equipment, has reminded us that uh, in healthcare industry or total health healthcare environment, bursting crises like COVID-19 sometimes really happen. So those planning for emergency should not be, on, be the paperwork only but the real preserved capacity or even the real cost necessary for the whole healthcare system. Yeah. Very good thoughts. Uh, Professor Griffith, your thoughts? Quick comments? Yeah, I hope that it doesn't. I mean, I hope that it does change, sorry. Um, because I think what it's done is, is, is a bit of a wake up call for all of us. Um, I think it's a wake up call for our community um, to recognize just how important their healthcare is. Um, and I think it's a wake up call for all of us. And, and I'm gonna throw in something from left field here. Um, and that's the importance of mental health um, from both um, a patient point of view um, or a community point of view, as well as from a healthcare provider point of view. And I think that um, this is something I'm hoping that um, will improve significantly going forward. The recognition that um, you need to make sure that you're looking after you, yourself um, and the people that are around you, regardless of whether or not they're your colleagues or whether or not they're your patients or the patient's relatives. Um, and, um, and how we do that, particularly um, using the opportunities around tele, um, telehealth or e-health, um, how we track data, social determinants of, of, of health, all of those sorts of things um, that are linked to, to collection of information and using information um, appropriately into the future, I hope will change significantly. Thank you. Dr. Yip? Uh, with COVID, uh, the patient is finally empowered to do 
three major things uh, in terms of choices that he has. He has the ability to choose who he wants to see, who, which healthcare provider gives me the best, best value uh, for my time and money uh, in terms of the care that I deserve and in terms of the uh, outcomes that I want, you know, for the condition that I have. Uh, it gives the consumer, number two, uh, the, the choice of which location they want to go. Uh, do I want to choose a facility that uh, is uh, near my place or do I choose telehealth where, where I am? And it also gives them, number three, the ability to choose when. So with telehealth, you can choose the timing of your desired nature. Uh, and so these are all the new paradigms that patients want uh, in, in the new world, you know, to choose, to make those choices. And for healthcare itself, uh, we are also changed forever because uh, the old paradigm of uh, cheaper, better, faster uh, used to be not something attainable, uh, but it's for us now a time to, to look at the distribution of cheaper, better, faster and safer and look at the ratio which, which we want to drive our healthcare and use technology to drive it in the direction that we desire uh, through the outcomes that we want. Uh, so I, I think it's an exciting time for all of us. Indeed, very good points. And Sam, last comment? Well, healthcare hasn't stood still for the last 2,000 plus years. And I don't think it's going to stand still for the next 2,000 years. I think all COVID has done is in that timeline has added a little bit of disruption that has sped up some of that change. But I certainly don't think this is the end and more likely than not, this is the beginning of another phase of transformation. Thank you. Very good points. Thank you, everybody. I'll throw it back to Tim. Thank you very much to all of our speakers. All of the speakers have been online as well. Uh, Guy Rubello, we just wanted to say thank you. And he also agrees with Sam's comments in terms of those um, uh, three starting points uh, for the future. I think it's, it's really been a fantastic series. And I want to thank all of our speakers today. A really great conversation. I'd also like to thank Eden Tang for organizing this because it was her vision in terms of understanding what the future of healthcare might be in this crisis. And she's put together a fantastic series and the team of uh, people working with her to actually uh, make sure the webinars run on time. Please, can we ask you to fill in the after form just to say your thoughts, your insights on what you found uh, useful here. And thank you everybody for your attendance on this series. All the best, thank you. Thank you, yeah. cheers.